you'll join me in standing, we're going to open up with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for this day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, for the ability to be able to congregate just like that, um, being able to plan out and have everything available to us, Lord, so that we can get together and still have service, still uh, congregate as, as one body, one church, Lord. We are so grateful for that. And um, we want to just honor you right now in this moment and praise you, Lord, and provide something for when we usually get together on Sunday mornings that others can do it via the internet, Lord. So we thank you so much for that opportunity, God. And we just want to bless you. We want to bless your name, Lord. Um, we want to lift up your name on high for you are good, God. You have kept us safe through a storm, Lord. And you will continue to do so, Father. We know that you are moving and you are working within us and around us, Father God. So I pray that you continue to do so. I pray that you are blessed by this worship, by this service, Lord. And we put all of this into your hands. Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do as we are trusting you. And throughout all of this, Father God, we love you. We want to honor you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. No longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. I won't forget the moment I heard you call my name Out of the grip of darkness Into the light of grace Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life Where there is dead religion And now there is living faith all of my hope and freedom I found in Jesus' name Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life No longer I who live But Christ in me For I've been born again my heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. When something says I am guilty, I'll point to the price you pay. When something says I'm not worthy, I'll point to that empty grave Just like Lazarus Oh, you brought me back to life No longer I who live But Christ in me For I've been born again My heart is free The hope take all eternity just like Lazarus oh you brought me back to life oh, oh you brought me back to life oh you brought me back to life oh you brought me No longer I who live, but 
Christ in me for I But Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said, you are mine. The enemy thought he had me. But Jesus said, you are mine. He had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus. Father God, you have resurrected us with your holy power. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord. You brought us back to life. You saw us, Lord. You redeemed us, renewed us, restored us, Father God. And we thank you so much for that, Lord. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. could do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go down. I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me. So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now And driver, you are enough Child, you are enough And I will be content in every circumstance You're forever enough, always enough, you're more than enough. I don't want to forget how I feel right now on the mountaintop. I can see so clear what it's all about. So stay by my side when the sun goes down. You've never been closer than Circumstance 
chosen I know who I am I know what you've spoken I'm already loved More than I could imagine And that is worship you Jesus I thank you for everyone who is able to make it out and I thank for ev thank you for everyone who is watching on the live stream Jesus just because our main building does not have power does not mean that you do not have power Jesus I pray that everyone in this building just begins to feel your love to feel your blood poured over this building into, into this place Lord Jesus we thank you for everything that you are for everything that you've done and for everything that you are going to do in Jesus name Amen.
Appreciate all of you being here tonight and uh, looking forward to this. We were um, we were coming home yesterday just trying to figure out. I, I thought maybe we would have power in the building and we would be able to have service there. Uh, and then this morning, Jimmy called me, or uh, Shelly called me and said, hey, we got power in the, uh, in the uh, Oasis building. I'm sorry, in the children's church. And I thought, oh, hallelujah. She said, I can't get a hold of Jimmy. And so, uh, and so we, uh, I, when I get a hold of him, I'll find out if we have power in the, uh, in the, in the main building. And I said, you don't have to get a hold of him. I'm heading over there right now. And uh, so I got up and I, I ran over there to, uh, to uh, find out. There we go. Uh, find out if we had power. And right when I got to, the, to turn on Flagstone, Jimmy called me, Pastor Mark, we don't have no power in the main building. I said, man, I wish you'd just let me find out myself. <laughs> Drove all the way over here. Uh, but anyway, as you can see, we've had some damage. Uh, one, of the, one of the canopies is missing and some other things. Uh, but um, I did get a text from Shelly that Centerpoint says it will be restored by Tuesday. So if you're without power in this neighborhood, maybe your power will be uh, restored by Tuesday as well. Uh, I pray. Uh, Jimmy just texted me before the service and said he had power, but it went out again. So uh, 
It's just crazy. All right, this time we're going to present our tithe and our offering. Uh, we just appreciate you being here. We want to give you the opportunity to be blessed. Uh, just greatly appreciate all of you again uh, being here. This is a very last minute thing. And uh, so we're just going to go with whatever God wants to do and see what happens. But uh, if you would, let's pray and then we'll get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that we have one building <laughs> that has power. Uh, electricity, because we, we always have power, but we just don't have electricity right now. And Lord, I thank you that we can gather in here and the, the ACs are working in, in good shape, brand new, basically. And, and Lord, thank you for all these that have come. It just excites my heart to see those that are here tonight. And, and Lord, more than anything, just love of time of fellowship. I, as we gathered together and I watched people just begin to talk and check on each other and ask how everybody was doing and sharing what had been going on in the last week. And Lord, that's really what this was all about, an opportunity to gather together in fellowship. And so thank you for that. Lord, we do bless this tithe and this offering. Ask you to uh, let us use it wisely. Lord, we, we have a lot of things that we've got to do. So, And I know people are, are strapped right now because they're trying to fix their stuff. So we just trust you. We just depend on you to supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory so that we can continue on doing what we've been called to do. And we thank you. We honor you. We ask you to bless those that give. Make a way for those who can't. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, Galatians chapter 2. We did have a chance to go to, um, to um, youth camp and visit with the youth, watch them and, and have a good time with them. Uh, I left here Thursday, Wednesday night after service. We had service in here, and uh, we had just a time of prayer and praise. And uh, drove over to San Antonio Wednesday night, got there, and Got back up early and and uh, got to go watch uh, Pastor uh, Caesar preach Thursday morning. Pastor David preached the conference uh, or, or the camp uh, each night. Both did just an outstanding job. Uh, Pastor David Cook just came up and was just bragging on our group and how amazing they were and and uh, just watched as God moved in the lives of our young people and and so excited to see them respond to what God was doing. It wasn't just that they were there, although they were pretty tired. They'd been at Fiesta, Texas all day. And, uh, and it was really encouraging to me some, to see some of the other youth actually doing the, hey, you need to wake up. You need to wake up. And uh, so I thought that was really encouraging. And, uh, but just so proud of our youth and God moved and, and I saw the light come on in some of those kids and, and uh, just really blessed my heart. So uh, thank you parents for allowing us to take them. I know we had a few people that were a little concerned since we were leaving the day of the hurricane. Uh, one of the churches kept calling me, asking me what we were going to do. And we kept calling the bus company. We kept calling the camp and they kept telling us, come on, it's good. It's good. So Finally, I told Pastor Caesar, hey, let's just tell them, be here at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, we're out of here. And uh, they did, and they got there, had a great time, got back safely. So uh, just very appreciative of all that, and uh, thank you for sending your youth. I know they were blessed, and they're going to be a blessing. Um, again, just been told that the power should be back on Tuesday night. Uh, we pray that that'll be the case. Uh, so we can have service back over there Wednesday night, and uh, we will see. Uh, as far as I know, I saw Christine in here a while ago. Uh, are we good for the 29th? 29th. Okay, so this week, I'm telling you, you have, you don't know how blessed you are. Even if you think you know, you don't. <laughs> how blessed you are to have such a children's pastor. Uh, give her a good God bless you. I'm telling you, she and Antoinette were over here working all week, uh, you know, trying to, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, trying to get everything ready and all that. They did have power. Uh, Wednesday night, we were excited because we saw the trucks over here. Shelly said, hey, the trucks were all over here working. And boy, we were excited that maybe they're going to get the power turned on in the, uh, the main building. And instead, they cut the power to the children's church. So um, because of that, we had no power. We had to make a decision. Uh, because we didn't know if we'd have the time. They couldn't go back to work. So we have postponed uh, VBS until the week of July 29th. 
So it'll be that week. So workers, that gives you a couple extra weeks to, uh, to catch your breath and uh, get ready. They will have time to get things going. Well, maybe a little time because she's going to be going to children's camp this uh, next week. So anyway, it's, it's just uh, our week from now. So anyway, lots of stuff going on. And uh, just please remember all of that. We're doing the very best we can with what we got. Uh, I was frustrated because I had put out a call uh, Wednesday and uh, talked to or, or sent out a phone tree. And I talked to people who said, I never got it. I did not realize that, that some of you did not have cell phone, uh, didn't have Internet. Uh, so you couldn't get all those things. So I'm thankful that you got them uh, today and that you're here tonight. And I don't want to take up a lot of time, but uh, I want to do something a little just more, more like we do on a Wednesday night. I want to teach tonight. And uh, I want to talk about crisis. And I think we would all agree that right now we are going through a crisis. And so it's so important. Uh, as Pastor Mike Malay says, let's start off with some scripture to make this official. If you would stand, please, for the reading of the word of God. Just one, uh, one portion of scripture, and then I'm going to teach a little bit. Uh, Galatians 6, 2 through 4, uh, the Amplified Bible says it like this. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I think that's pretty interesting right there. We were never meant to do life alone. We need the love and care of others as much as we are needed by others in the same way. We need each other. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, for the next few minutes, Lord, I pray you would use me. Let me speak these words to challenge us, to encourage us, and help us, Lord, as we have the opportunity to minister to those who are dealing with crisis. And Lord God, I know maybe there's some here tonight that are going through crisis. And as I pray, Lord God, let, let them hear something tonight that would encourage them that they're, that they're uh, experiencing life. It's just a typical thing, but uh, or the regular thing. But they have a hope that the world doesn't have in the middle of crisis. So we thank you for that. Now, Lord, just use me tonight. Anoint me. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and our hearts to receive what you have for us tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, several years ago, I taught on this, uh, actually a seven-week study on crisis. And uh, as I began to prepare yesterday, uh, coming home, it was a roller coaster ride. Could we have service? No. Could we have service? Yes. Up and down. And so finally, I just said, you know what? We're doing it. And uh, so as I was preparing and praying, I felt impressed to talk about this because I'm hearing so much about crisis right now and, and all that we're going through. And, and I believe, again, it will help you as you minister to people going through crisis as much as it will if you're here tonight and uh, you're in crisis. Maybe you're without power. You've been without. And you really just feel like everything's falling apart. And tonight I've got a, a, some encouragement for you. Um, we live in really just an amazing world. It really is. When you think about all of the things, it's full of excitement. It's full of challenge. Technology, guys, it's unbelievable what technology can do. Isn't it amazing how quickly technology can be taken out, though? Uh, and it's so funny because the other day we were talking, and we don't have Internet. Albert was here, and he said, what did we do before Internet? And I, I don't even remember, and it hasn't been that long. Uh, but the world is really unbelievable. We got a new car I'm not bragging, but it, it just, it's got way too many push button things. And, and my grandson says, Papa, it's magic technology. And, uh, I, you know, it's one of those things that's got it. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in cars now, they're putting cameras on you. Uh, when, you're, when you're driving, you're right behind your steering wheel, there's a camera. And if you start nodding, mine says, get a cup of coffee. It's crazy. Technology is crazy. But as crazy and as wonderful as this world is, we still go through difficulties. We still go through trials. We still go through troubles. And technology and all of those things cannot stop what has been put into motion. 
And so the truth is, none of us are exempt. We all know that. We all deal with difficulties and we all deal with things that go on in our life. And, and if we don't, we know somebody that's very close to us that is, or is going through some difficulty that's a crisis. And at some point, I think some of us feel like Job when he said, the thing that I fear the most has happened. The thing that I feared the most has come upon me. That's what, what I was afraid of has happened. Now, those who are in crisis need to be encouraged. They need to be lifted up. And we, as believers in Jesus Christ, have the opportunity to do that. We have the opportunity to give them hope that they can't find anywhere else. And so we need to be available and we need to be ready for that. So the real question is, if you think about it, are you ready to minister to someone in crisis? If someone comes up to you and says, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm lost. My whole life is turned upside down. Are you ready to minister to them with that? Do you know what to say? Do you know what to do? It's amazing that uh, we, we are faced with that. Um, now, in all fairness, uh, to those of us who want help, who are desperate to help in those situations, really, what do you say? I mean, really, it, it's not easy. Uh, those, are going, those that are going through a difficult time are hurting, they're broken, and they're needing something. And so we have to come up with something, some way that, that can help them through the difficulty that they're facing. And uh, so tonight we're going to talk about that. And hopefully it will help you because in the days to come, we might actually run into somebody like that, that, that would come to you and be hurting like that. Um, when we call, come across someone that's hurting, and maybe you'll agree with me, maybe you won't, but I think this is pretty typical. Uh, when you come across someone who's really going through a crisis in their life, we typically respond one of two ways. One of two ways. The first is we withdraw from them. We stay away from them because we just don't know what to say. If I go over there, what if they ask me this? Or what if they, I, I don't know what to say. And, and we hear about what's happened to them. We're hurting for them, but we avoid them because we just don't know what to do. What do we say to them? How do we, we respond to their questions? We, what, you know, I'm thinking, oh, well, what if they ask me this? What if they ask me that? And so because of it, instead of calling them or, or whatever, we just avoid them. We, we just avoid them. And we pray, Lord, send someone like Pastor Mark or Pastor Ron who knows what to say in that moment so that they can be touched and, and help them to say the right thing. <laughs> I'm going to speak for Pastor Mark. We don't always know what to say. There are times when we are just, I've had people tell me things and I'm, I'm embarrassed because I know my jaw hits the floor. You, you what? <laughs> you know? And so people will avoid them because they don't know what to say. The other thing we do is just the opposite. We love them, we care about them, and we want, we want to somehow say something or do something. So we go over there and we run our mouth. We just talk and talk and talk and we don't say nothing. We don't, we're just talking to talk because we're afraid if we stop, they're going to ask us a question. You know, and then they start to ask something. No, you know, you got this. And so then we start throwing out every cliche that we know. So we can try to light them. Oh, don't worry. It's going to be all right. Hey, just remember, it's darkest before the dawn. Or, you know what? Have you really looked at your situation? Because there are so many, so many that are worse off than you are. I'm going to tell you something. That does nothing when you tell people that. I, I, yesterday I was getting the car ready uh, to, to leave San Antonio and a very dear pastor friend of mine called and he said, Mark, I just want to check on you guys. I haven't heard anything. Uh, you know, how's it going? We talked, casual talk and everything. Hey, do you need a, a crew? I will get a crew together and come over and, and do whatever. And I said, man, thank you. You know, and really did touch my heart. So precious. And then he said, 
He said, so what, what's the deal with the church? And I said, well, we've been without power. We actually had power go off right in the middle of our service last week. And uh, our people were nice enough and kind enough to stay, even though it got hot. And I said, but now we haven't had power for a week. And, and they're talking about maybe another seven days. I don't know. And he said, well, you know what? A uh, hurricane came through here. Uh, several years ago, and we were without power for two weeks. And some of our people without, were without power for two months. And you know what? That didn't make me feel one bit better. That didn't help me a bit. Because now I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, how are we going to? We don't have power in the church for two months. I'm going to have to take over the, the youth building and run everybody out. I don't know what. We're going to have to have six services every Sunday or something. <laughs> You know, two months, I don't know. And, and so, but we say those things, why? We don't know what to say. We, we feel like we've got to say something. I, I just got to say something. And, and so because of that, sometimes we say things that actually don't help. You know, and that didn't offend me. I knew his heart. I knew what he was saying. And so I, and I appreciate him so much. But, you know, it really didn't, it just didn't help me that much to tell me that, oh, well, we were out power two months. Well, nice for you. You know, we want it now, you know. And um, even, though, even though we're only trying to help, both those responses, if we're not careful, can cause even further damage or further hurt to those people. So we have to be careful. That's why it's so important, I think, to have some idea about crisis and how we can be more effective in those difficult moments. Uh, we all need this because life is full of crisis. If, if you haven't been here, I think crisis is like the old saying. If you haven't had one, you're, you're, or you're either in a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or going into a crisis. You know, you're, you're always headed that away. And uh, so we need this. And crisis is no respecter of persons. So as Christians, we're not exempt from this. Uh, maybe you're here tonight and you're experiencing this. You, you are without power. You're, you're dealing with these kind of things. Or maybe you just know people around you, but you're avoiding them because you don't know what to say. Or you're going to, you know, do the other side. You're going to just keep talking and hopefully they won't have time to ask you a question. But I want you to know that if you will just do a few things, that God can use you in the midst of crisis to be a light to those around you. He could truly use you, and you couldn't believe it, the way that it works and how God can use you if you're just willing to just do a few things. Um, there are so many things that can cause crisis. I mean, we're going through one right now, a natural disaster. Uh, I think that's what they call it nowadays. Uh, we've dealt with this hurricane. It is something we literally have zero control over. Now, some would say, well, the government can, can steer these things. Okay, whatever, you know. We have no control over this. As far as I remember, the, one of the last times I heard about the hurricane was it's going to go down to Mexico. And then I woke up Monday morning, and it was saying, hey, I'm here. And my oak trees were bending over, and, and it was just crazy. It's just something we have no control over. Uh, we're going through something that hasn't, a crisis that doesn't just affect one person. It's affected our whole community, our whole city. Uh, and it's just crazy. And, and so think about that kind of crisis. But there's many other crises that we deal with if we're not dealing with that other people deal with that we may have an opportunity to speak into. Think about it. You're at work. One of your coworkers comes up looking really down. Hey, what's up? My wife just called. She filed for divorce. What you going to say? I'm, I'm not telling you to say something now, but just what you going to say? You know, uh, well, that's good. I, I don't, you know, I, I mean, we might find ourselves in that position. Somebody at work comes up. I don't know what I'm going to do. They just laid me off. I got bills. My kids are, what am I going to do? Find another job. I don't, you know. I'm just trying to make the point that what do we say in those moments? Because those are crises for those people. That's difficult. What about this one? I've been here. Wow. I went to the doctor yesterday and he, he didn't give me any hope. What do I do? 
I mean, we're faced with those things. As believers, we should have uh, something to say or we should have an ability to listen to them. Um, what about this one? Man, my son left home yesterday or two days ago, and we, we can't find him now. We can't get a hold of him. I don't know what to do. Man, I just, that would break my heart. But how do you encourage those people? What do you say that's going to make everything right? Well, if you're looking for that, you can forget it. It's not going to happen. Finding that thing that's just going to turn the whole thing upside down. So what can we do? And these are just a few things I'm just trying to get you thinking about crisis. What you do in that moment. What can you say to really help get them through? Uh, something really important to understand, and I've talked about this because I, I really believe this. The reality of a crisis is it is different for everyone. It's different for everyone. If I were to have each one of you stand up and tell of a crisis that you faced in your life, you would get up, and I know that everybody here would love you, but there would be somebody here, as you told your story about the crisis, who would look to their neighbor and go, they call that a crisis? You want to hear a crisis? Let me get up. Because, see, we all look at our crisis as, as different. You, what I think is a crisis, you may laugh at. And what you think is a crisis, I'm thinking, man, get over it. So we have to understand that crisis is different for everyone. We've got to understand that a crisis is something that overwhelms you. It immobilizes you. It takes you out of the game. A crisis is a crucial time. It's a significant time in the life of that person because crisis causes change. And if we're not careful, we're judging them because you should get over that. Man, come on. Really, you call that a crisis? Look, you may not understand it as a crisis, but to them, it's a crisis. And they're on the verge. And, they, man, they need something. It takes you out of your comfort zone. It, literally, a crisis, it can be a turning point in someone's life. So we've got to take it serious. I know in the medical profession, you may hear a doctor uh, trying to... to, to tell you or describe what's going on with a patient. And you, you might hear them say, well, you know, the crisis is going to come this afternoon. Well, what does that mean, Doc? What that means is there's going to be a turning point. It's either going to get really bad by this afternoon or it's going to get better. But the crisis is coming. Uh, thing about crisis, when people are in it, they make a lot of choices during crisis. Some good, some not so good. And the thing is, we may look at their choices that they make during crisis, and we may say, really? What were you thinking? Well, you know what? They weren't thinking. They weren't thinking because they were in the middle of a crisis. Our coping mechanisms uh, in crisis time don't work like they should. They're overwhelmed. Our defense is down. And, and even people who are usually those people that are always in control and they got it all together, when they're in the middle of a crisis, they can, they can make bad choices because they're overwhelmed. Now, crisis has been called a time of opportunity or despair. And you might not agree or you might agree, but it's a pivotal point. Uh, a crisis can actually be a time of growth and learning if we accept it. A very basic uh, definition of crisis is this. A state in which people have failed to resolve a problem they are facing. I think that's a pretty simple explanation. The fact is, I can't get this problem solved. Normally, I can solve it, and I don't know what to do about it. I don't know how I'm going to finish it. And it becomes a crisis. Again, these are just things to be aware of. As you're dealing with someone who's going through a crisis, or maybe you're going through a crisis, it's good to know. Because if you're the one going through the crisis, then you're beginning, I pray, to see that you're not, you're not weird. You're not broken. You're going through what's normal for life. You're facing the difficulties of this life. 
Everything you're going through may be foreign to you. And you think, man, I, because I'm thinking this way, because I can't think this way, because I can't do that. What is wrong with me? You're going through crisis. You're facing the difficulty. Now, signs of someone in crisis will vary. But most people, when they're in crisis, they're out of control. They're out of balance. Um, crisis opens the door for great stress. I think we're all aware of that. Uh, when we get stressed out, then we start to panic. Then we start to uh, feel like because we're panicking, now I'm defeated. Uh, when you were in crisis situation, I don't know if you've noticed this in people, but watch because it happens. They will begin to decrease their deficiency. Because they can't get it done, what do they do? They don't do anything. They don't do anything. They don't know what to do. They've tried everything. Nothing's worked. So they just quit. They just give up. And they're not getting anything done. Um, their whole focus is if I could just have some relief. If I could just have some relief. Blanche used to tease me all the time because when I worked in this building for many, many years and I would have all the youth and we would have youth camp coming and I would, I would tell her, man, if I can just get through this next week, it's going to be good. And then the next week would come and I'd, if I could just get through this week, oh, it's going to be better. You know, and it wasn't that it was bad. It was just so busy. But you never get there. You never get to that place where, oh, now it's over. No, we're always going and, and doing. And, and so when you're in crisis, it seems like the end is not in sight. There's no end in sight. When is this going to be over? I think you could relate to this if any of you have been to Galveston. It's like going to the beach. Go out there. The waves are big, but you're having a blast, man. You're in the water, and, and things are so good. And all of a sudden, as you're just jumping around playing, you catch a good wave, and it knocks you down. I mean, it knocks you down. You go into the water, and you kind of work yourself back up. And as soon as you get back up, what happens? Another wave. And, man, it just knocks you right back down again. And, and, and the first couple are like, no big deal. But then all of a sudden, you start to panic a little bit. Say, wait, I got to get up. And you start trying to get up and you can't get up. And you start fighting just to get your head above water. And so now you're really just flailing. You're going to do whatever it takes to get out of that water and get back to shore. And, and that's kind of the way crisis is. Especially just like right now, you don't have power. But then they say, oh, well, I'm going to get power tomorrow night. Thank you, Lord. And tomorrow night comes and they say, oh, it's going to be two more days. And this is going to be two more days. And this is going to be Tuesday. <laughs> and it just overwhelms you because one after the other wave hits you. And normally you can handle all those things, but you're just tired of it. For many, they get to the place where they literally, their minds just shut down, can't focus, can't think right. And so they literally just shut down. And that's when they need us. That's when they need someone that will come alongside them. And be there with them. Um, I don't think we all know. Or I think we all know that crisis never gives a notice. Now, we knew there was a hurricane coming, but did we know that it was going to do what it did? I went to San Antonio, and uh, one of my good friends there kind of caught me off guard. Because he said, well, how are you doing? And this is something else that uh, we do all the time. And I think I caught him off guard. Uh, because how are you doing, Pastor Mark? And I said, you know what? I'm not doing too good right now. Well, what's wrong? I said, man, we have no power at the church. I'm worried about my people. I don't know what to do. It is so crazy. And he's like, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, you know. And he said, I, I didn't think Houston got hit that bad. I said, what news have you been watching? You know, but, but he wasn't expecting that answer. He wasn't expecting for me to be honest with him because usually we're not. Usually I say, oh, I'm doing good, man. I'm doing fine. Well, I'm not. I'm worried about my church. I'm worried about my people. And, and God forgive me if whatever, but, I, you know, that just comes with the territory. <laughs> so, you know, we, we get into that place where we're in crisis, and, and all of a sudden you look up, and boom, there it is. And we don't want to understand what's going on. And we feel lost. We feel disconnected. And because it hits without warning, it, it affects our security. Well, you know, I thought I was safe. 
I thought, I thought nobody could miss. I thought, you know, man, now all of a sudden, well, you know, the door won't lock and this and that. And so it, it messes with our security and it shakes you to the core and causes you to question who, 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 what, what is going on here? And one of the main problems with crisis is resolution is never certain. When is this going to end? When is this going to be over with? People in crisis just seem to be hanging in limbo. They, they just don't know what's going to happen next. And the biggest problem is they have no control over it. And that's why I believe crisis is usually really more difficult for men than women. And I say that because men like to be in control. I want to be in control, and when I don't have control, I don't understand it, I don't like it, and so I don't know how to deal with it. And guys, you know it's true. We want to be in control. But you're not going to be in control of hurricane. <laughs> so you got to just do whatever comes. Crisis presents a great dilemma, especially when you want to minister to somebody who you know is hurting, you know is going through crisis. Those in crisis will ask you, what do I do? How, how do I get out of this? What's the right choice? What's the right thing for me to do in this situation? I don't know. Please tell me what the right thing to do is. And you know what? In our desire to help, we want to tell them. But let me tell you, be careful because crisis lowers their self-esteem. Christ lowers their esteem, crisis, <laughs> lowers their esteem. They can't figure out and because they can't, they lose confidence. And then you come along and ask you, what, what do I do? How, how can I get out of this? And so you start trying to give them answers. And you know what you're going to do? They're going to start depending on you to give them the answer. I can't, I can't think of it, but you, oh, that's good. That's right. That's what I'll do. And so, you know, I don't have to worry about answers anymore. You know why? Because you got them now. And so now you own their crisis. You're, you're having to come up with all the answers, and they're expecting it. And it's like a catch-22. They, they, they don't want to ask you questions, but they ask a question, you give an answer. So now so it just puts it all on you. So you have to be careful. Before the crisis, that person might have been very functional, man. They might have been able to take care of business, but this crisis has taken them out of the game. They don't know what to do, and they come to you, and they ask you, and you want to minister to them, so you try to give them help, and you try to answer what they want, and you try to give them the right direction, but you've got to be careful because they become dependent on you, and when that happens, the best thing to do when somebody's in crisis and they say, I don't know, what do you think I ought to do? Or what direction should I go? Never just give them, you know what, you need to do this. Don't do that. Stop. Well, have you thought about this? Have you, have you thought about maybe trying this? You know, what if, what if we call and what if we do this? Because then you're involving them in the answer. And when you involve them, all of a sudden they're going, wait a minute, I, I, I did that. And their self-esteem starts to come back. You can help, they can help you find the answer and make them part of the solution. And it gives them the, the, the strength to say, you know what, I, I can do this. Not telling them uh, what to do, but guiding them in what they need to do. And it helps build their, their self-esteem again, and they won't become dependent on you. Now, the other side of this is think about this. Somebody goes to you, I don't know, what do I do? And you say, you know what, here's what you need to do. And they do it, and it blows up in their face. So you know what? They're not going to ask you anymore. And they're not going to depend on you anymore. So it's best to just try to guide them. Get them to make the decision and just guide them in that. Um, as we think of the crisis going on around us right now, there's a couple of things that, that people are dealing with that are typical in crisis. There's what's called crisis shock. Crisis shock. Uh, whether we realize it or not, we all went through that. As you were sitting in your, in your living room or whatever Monday morning and watching your trees bend and, and watching the waters rise and seeing the power flicker on and off and all of that stuff, 
you were dealing with crisis shock. It's like, what's going on here? I don't know. And then all of a sudden, your cell phone doesn't work. Well, let me get on the TV and what? Now the TV doesn't work because it's connected to the internet, which doesn't work. So now you have no contact and ability to know what's going on. And so we're, you're dealing with crisis shock. Um, and this kind of shock can knock the wind out of you. Uh, you begin to question, what, what is going on? I, how am I going to get this? Who, who, I don't, and then you try to call. There's nothing. So you're dealing with crisis shock. And you feel vulnerable because now you don't have all those things. And you're exposed. And we try to deal with it. Uh, I don't know. Did any, does anybody have an AM radio anymore? Anybody know what an AM radio is? You know, maybe I guess you could go out in your car. Maybe your car still gets a radio signal or something in the midst of all of that. But we get into that, sit, that point where we're so dependent on those things. And then when they're not there, we're in crisis shock. And so we try different things and, and hopes that that'll work. Um, if that doesn't work, then our tension builds up and all those things start kicking in. Uh, we just plunge deep into crisis. And understand, uh, crisis shock is not, no one's exempt from it. Nobody sat there and said, oh, this is really, ooh, look at that tree fall on my car. Ooh, that's nice, you know. We all dealt with that. So we all dealt with this. Um, and the thing about this is, that's the initial part, part of crisis. It's the initial reaction. And can I tell you, there is no time limit for that, to get over that. I want you to understand that. There's no time limit. You know, you, you see somebody, and they're still going with something, through something. And it's been four or five, man, it's been a week. Come on now. Really? I mean, just get over it. There's no time limit. Don't, don't be putting, well, you know, well, I got over it. I don't care about you. I care about me, <laughs> you know. And it takes longer it's for some people than others. So don't put a time limit on them to move forward from that shock. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. If you're ministering to these people, don't put time limits on them. Don't restrain them, you know, because we're all different. You know, some of you might, might have by that afternoon is like no big deal. But there are other people who are still in that shock. They're still dealing without no power. And they're, they're like, ah, what is going to go on? I'll just get over it. No. Just minister to them. And that leads to crisis exhaustion. Crisis exhaustion. Maybe you called somebody Monday afternoon after the storm. I got lots of calls, and thank all of you that call me. How you doing? Oh, man, I, I, we're here. You know, well, this is up, this is up, this is up. But, but we're doing okay. We're, we made it. We're, we're alive, and we made it. Okay, you put the phone down. Well, you don't call them again. But guess what? Crisis exhaustion can sit in. Because when you're going through a crisis, it can wear you out. It can wear you out. Think about it. You have no power for a week. You're hot. You're miserable. You haven't been sleeping. You haven't been eating right. The money's running out. The frustration comes on, and all of a sudden, crisis, exhaustion. I'm just, I'm just so tired. I looked at those youth, some of those youth, uh, Thursday night after they got through with the service. Everything's good. And, man, they got that, they just got that burst of energy. And then all of a sudden, I bet on the bus it was about a minute, and they were, you know, the exhaustion kicked in. And, and I talked to some of the leaders. They, Ricky told me he slept for 10 hours or better uh, after he got home. But we're just exhausted. Something to think about here, um, again, check back with them. Check back today, tomorrow morning, when you go home or when you get up and remind people there's no church services, but check on them. Hey, man, I know I talked to you last week. Uh, you said you were doing okay, but is everything still okay? Because I know you had some damage and I know some things. Check on them because that exhaustion might got to them. It might have really taken hold of them. Don't just forget about them and put, put them to the side. Um, when we go into crisis, we usually, we usually, ha uh, look at the way time is, oh, I got a little time. Um, no, I don't either. Oh, <laughs> uh, when we go into crisis, we usually interpret what's happened to us in one of three ways. You know, this, it's either a threat, a loss, or a challenge. And a crisis like this is no different. It's no different. People will see it as a threat, a loss, or a challenge. 
And that's why we have to be careful about the way we judge people because you, what you see as a challenge, they may see as a threat or vice versa. They may see as a loss. And so we don't always see it the same. We've got to remember that. And, and uh, you know, if you went back to school, and you remember the first day of school and whatever subject was your weak subject. And you went in there and the teacher stood up in the first day of class and said, I'm going to tell you right now that this class can be the hardest class you've ever taken. And today I'm going to tell you that nobody is going to make an A in this class. Some of you are going to barely make it and many of you are going to fail. I didn't have that, but I've heard of it. And so... What's your reaction? You're going to have one of three reactions. You're going to hear that and go, oh, I'm done. I'm, I'm over, you know, I've lost or whatever. Or you're going to hear it and say, well, that's it for me. I, you know, I'll try, you know. Or you're going to feel a challenge. Oh, really? Nobody's going to make an A, huh? Well, I'll show you. So we, we, we all go through those three things, and we went through those three things, or you're going through those three things right now from this crisis that we've just faced. Uh, something else to be aware of in crisis, even in our lives and the lives of others, um, this is something I want you to really get, because it may be dealing with, it, with you. Um, sometimes a crisis caused by something can actually bring back a crisis that was caused by something else. You're dealing with this, and all of a sudden, these unresolved issues start showing up. Because, wait a minute, why am I feeling this? I, this has nothing to do with it. That's because of crisis. These unresolved issues start showing up. Um, when you go through crisis, there, there are some different phases, much like grief. So when you're talking with people, think about this. That are, that are going through crisis, think about this. We know the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. And in a sense, crisis brings out those same five stages. Uh, they're called a little bit different, but they're basically the same. So as you're ministering to somebody and you can see what stage they're in in their crisis, it helps you better know how to uh, minister to them. Let me skip over some of this because I have lots of points. This is seven weeks of teaching in one night. Um, okay, Pastor Caesar and I were talking about a book that we uh, read last year for a college class. And um, with that, it said that uh, during something of this nature, there has to be a calming voice. There has to be a calming voice, someone that will speak into the middle of the storm, someone will, who look, will look past the, uh, all that's happening and be an encourager. And I'm here tonight to tell you that's you. As a Christian, that's you. As a believer, that's your responsibility and your opportunity uh, to be the calming voice in the midst of the storm for other people. Uh, so how do we do it? How do we go? And I, I'll just, and I'm, I'm not even going to be able to touch it hardly, but um, so what do we do? Somebody calls, and, uh, man, this just happened to me. Well, we don't want to be like Job's friends. Remember Job. Job went through all these things that, remember this, God allowed. I don't see anybody smiling, but God allowed it. Okay. Job went through all that. And while he's in the midst of the worst part of his crisis, three friends show up. And what did they do? They sat there for seven days didn't say a word. The first thing that you need to learn when you're dealing with going to speak to somebody in crisis, you don't have to talk. You don't have to say anything. We feel like we've got to say, I've got to say something profound. I'm a pastor. I've got to say something. Look, your time will come, but you can just listen. Listen to what they say. They want to tell their story. They're hurting. They're broken. They, they want somebody that will listen. That's your opportunity. You don't have to talk. Job's friends messed up when they started talking. I mean, for seven days, they just were there with him. They showed him how much they cared. They were there to support him. And then all of a sudden, they started talking, and they messed it all up because they came out with completely the wrong things. 
So first, um, we just let them talk. I'll just share this last story. I've told it before. Uh, two weeks before I retired from the fire department, we lost five firefighters in uh, one fire. And uh, four that day, and one took about a year, and he passed away. And so I was still active at the station, but I was also working for the union, or not working, but I was volunteering for the union as a chaplain. They called me, hey, we got five families we've got to deal with. Come on, come on up here. And uh, they gave me a car, and, you know, for that two weeks, about seven, eight days. Um, you know, I ministered to this one family of this firefighter, a captain that passed away. And it was interesting because I didn't know him. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. And so we go the next morning. We meet with all these families. They assign me to this family. And, and I talked with them briefly uh, and such. And then the, uh, they tell me that, uh, okay, you're going to stay with them for the next three or four days. I'm going to stay with them? What do you? No, well, not stay at night, but during the day. Look, anything they need, you do it. I said, well, okay. So the next day they're having a big family meeting, and they asked me to be there. I don't know these people. I, I, I'm feeling really awkward. But I went, and I sat there all day long, and I sat back off to the side, and I was there, and they, every once in a while they would come up and ask me a question. <clears throat> Not a lot, but they would ask me stuff, and I, I had some answers. And so then the next day, they had to go to the funeral home and, and pick out everything and ask me to go with them there. I don't know this family. It's not like, you know, well, hey, I, you know, but this is my opportunity and this is my responsibility. So I went with them and watched them pick out casket and all these things. And it was, it was so difficult. And, and I, I didn't know what to say to them in this moment. And then the third day, I went back with the family, all came over, and, and by now they're kind of talking to me a little more and, and things, but I, I just, I felt awkward. And so then I asked, I got to sit with them that afternoon, and just kind of as we do when we're going to do a funeral, we um, usually sit with the family, just ask questions and try to get some idea. My, whenever I do a funeral, I always tell them, look, we knew that person, but maybe everybody didn't. So tell me things about them that, that people will be interested in knowing. And so we talked about that. I did the funeral, 10,000 firemen out there. I, was, I really wasn't a nervous wreck. I can honestly say that. God just touched me, and I, I did it. And afterwards, I'm going to be honest with you, I felt like I failed completely because I, I didn't know what to say to them. I, I was just there. And after the funeral, the brother walked up to me, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going <laughs> to, you know, thanks a lot, dude. See ya, you know. And he came up to me, and he said, Mark, you'll never know what you did for us. And I'm thinking, who are you talking to? All I did was sit over there in your kitchen and eat your cakes and stuff, you know. <laughs> Not one all, but. And he said, man, it really made a difference just having you there. And I realized at that moment, in crisis, you don't always have to say something. Just need to be there. Just need to be there for them. And you know what I felt like it did afterwards? Because afterwards, I met with them again, and I felt, you know what? I've earned the right now to speak into your life. And they listened to me, you know. It wasn't like they had, okay, you know. But, but I had done enough to where they let me in, and I could speak to them. I wish I could say they all got saved and, and had a wonderful story. That's not the case. But I did get to speak with them, and I earned that right. And you know what? In crisis, even though you don't know what to say, you don't have to say anything. Just listen, and you earn the right when the time comes, and it will come, I guarantee you, to be able to say, you know, you know how I get through this? I've got a God that loves me. i got a God that really cares about me. And he cares about you too. And it opens the door for you to minister to those in crisis. So I know there's a lot of information. I don't even know if you'll remember any of it. All of those on, on live stream tomorrow, just stream tomorrow. 
Hopefully you get this if you want to get some of this information. But there's just good things to learn because you're going to run, run across somebody and cry. You may go to the store tomorrow and somebody has a meltdown because there's no butter. It's not about the butter. It's about the fact that they've just been through it the last week and they're in crisis and they need somebody that'll listen. Amen. Won't you bow with me?